here we have the instruction that we may use a calculator or otherwise to determine the exact value of the expression that we have right there and of course we know that in making calculation those that are enclosed in brackets will take precedence so the operations inside of the brackets will be carried out first so we may square 3.7 and we may also divide 6.24 by 1.3 So square 3.7 and perform the operation that is inside of the bracket. So we square this and of course divide 6.2 by 1.3. Square 3.7 we'll get 13.69 and we'll divide 6.24 by 1.3 we'll get 4.8. Then we perform the subtraction operation indicated right here and the result is 8.89. A total of 1,200 students attend Top View High School. The ratio of teachers to students is 1 to 30. How many teachers are there at the school? So how many teachers do we have? The ratio is 1 to 30. The number of students is 30 times the number of teachers. To find the number of teachers, divide the number of students by 30. And we end up with 40. So we have 40 teachers right there. Two-fifths of the students own personal computers. How many students do not own personal computers? And of course, the situation is like this. Sometimes a student is answering a particular question and they do not take too much heed to the word not that is in the problem. And they go straight ahead and determine how many students own personal computers. So it is said right here, how many students do not own personal computers? So two-fifths of the students own personal computers. The remaining three-fifths do not own personal computers. So three-fifths of 1,200 and that is equal to 720. 30% 30 of the students who own personal computers also own PlayStation. So 30% of the students who own personal computers also own playstations and this is another part of the problem that we need to pay special attention to 30 percent of the students who own personal computers also own playstation what fraction of the students in the school own playstations so of course let me take a, another go at the problem 30% of the students who own personal computers also own PlayStation. But the answer that we have calculated here is not the number of students who own personal computers. Some students will go straight ahead and use the 720 as it is given right there. And they will make a dreadful mistake in doing so. So, 720 do not own personal computers. The rest of them own personal computers and that will be 480. So those are the ones that we are talking about. Right? Some students might just use the 720 straight ahead under examination pressure, did not read the question properly and would have missed some very key words in the statement of the problem. So 30% of the remaining which is 480 own PlayStation. So 30% of that 480. Now of course 30% is 30 divided by 100 and that will give us 0 0.3. So 0 0.3 multiplied by 480 gives 144.
and that is the number of students that own play stations write the result as a fraction of the total number of students as indicated by the statement of the problem express your answer in its lowest term so we want a fraction of the students in the school who own playstations and we need that in its lowest term so do not forget the total number of students in the school 1200 and of course 144 own playstations so write that by reducing the fraction to its lowest term we get 3 over 25 binary operations a asterisk b is equal to a b minus b over a need to take careful note right here that it is the second letter that is the numerator not the first so 4 asterisk 8 requires the product of 4 and 8 in the fraction that is subtracted the second number is the numerator and the first number is the denominator so 4 asterisk 8 is 4 times 8 and of course it is 8 the second number that will be the numerator of the fraction that we have subtracted and there we have it so 4 8 is 32 and 8 divided by 4 is 2 so 32 minus 2 and that is equal to 30 next we need to find 2 asterisk all of 4 asterisk 8 that's not very difficult if we try to exercise some presence of mind 4 asterisk 8 is what we have calculated from the previous part of the problem so 4 asterisk 8 already is 30 so we may replace 4 asterisk 8 with 30 so 2 asterisk 30 what do we do 2 times 30 30 divided by 2 notice that the one that is second is the one that is placed in the numerator and we have 60 minus 15 2 times 30 60 30 divided by 2 15 and 60 minus 15 is equal to 45 we have an algebraic expression of algebraic fractions and we are expected to express that fraction in its simplest form so what do we do we are dividing here so we will invert and multiply dividing by a fraction or any number is equivalent to multiplying by its reciprocal or multiplicative inverse when dividing a fraction by another invert the divisor and change the division sign to multiplication like that right then what do we do the fraction may then be reduced by a common factor of P and another common factor of Q so we see that P is in the numerator and denominator and we have Q and Q there of course by doing that we see P into P squared is P and Q with Q will cancel completely and we will have 5 alone in the numerator and the denominator will be 12 Q so the Q's are gone completely and we have what P squared divided by P is P so we will have a P remaining in the denominator and all the other letters are gone so we will have 5 in the numerator and 3 times 4 12 do not forget that the P did not cancel completely so we will have 5 divided by 12 P
as in recent years, simultaneous equations are given in applied problem format, that is, worded problem. A stadium has two sections, A and B. Tickets for section A cost A dollars each, and the tickets for section B cost B dollars each. Johanna paid $105 for five section A tickets and three section B tickets. So, five section A and three section B. Multiply the cost of section A tickets, which is A, by the number of them. Then, multiply the cost of section B tickets which is B, so the cost is B, so we multiply by the number of them, and the number of them is 3. So we will have right there 5A plus 3B. And of course, we know the total cost, so when we add them, the cost is $105. So we will have added together to give 105. And of course, the one that we have just done is analogous to the one that we have there. The next equation may be formed on a similar argument. So we will take that $63 that we have there and that will be equal to four section A tickets, so 4A, and one section B tickets, so 1B or B. So 4A plus B. Okay. Next, we will find the values of A and B. So there we have our two equations and of course we are going to solve this pair of simultaneous equation and we are opting to use the method of elimination. We realize that we have 3B here. If we multiply this by 3, we will have 3B and we will be able to eliminate the Bs but cannot do that unless we multiply the entire equation by 3. So let us do that. Multiply the entire equation by 3, we have... 3 fours, so we have 12a plus 3b is equal to 189. Good. With the coefficients of y being the same, we may subtract equation 1 from equation 3. So by doing that, we will eliminate the b's. So we say 12a minus 5a, that is 7a, the b's are gone. Then 189 minus 105 will be equal to 84. So we will have 7a is equal to 84. Dividing through by 7, the 7 will be eliminated from the left hand side. 84 divided by 7 will be 12. So a is equal to 12. And what do we do with that? We put that into equation 2. And there we have equation 2, right there. Or we may use this occurrence of the equation 2 that we have right here. So what do we say? Where we see A, we put 12. So 4 times 12 plus B is equal to 63. We have it right there. 4 12s plus B is equal to 63. So we get 48. So, eliminating 48 or subtracting 48 from both sides, we will have B is equal to 63 minus 48, which is equal to 15. Therefore, we have found the values of A and B. The Venn diagram represents information on the type of games played by members of a youth club. All members of the club play at least one game. What does that mean? That means we do not have anybody in that youth club that we will have any representation of inside of the Venn diagram but not inside of the sets that are represented by circles. So everybody that will be able to be represented in that Venn diagram will be in one of those circles. And of course S represents the set of members who play squash. T represents the set of the members who play tennis. 
H represents the set of members who play hockey. Leo, Mia, and Neil are three members of the youth club. State what games is or are played by Leo. So let's see. What do we do there? In order to determine the games that are played by Leo, take note of the sets that he belongs to. So what sets does Leo belong to? Leo is right there. And of course we have the two circles going right there. Hockey and tennis. So Leo plays tennis and hockey. Next, Mia. In order to determine the games that are played by Mia, take note of the sets that she belongs to. Right. So she belongs to S and T. So she plays squash and tennis. Then finally, Neil. In order to determine the games that are played by Neil, take note of the sets that he also belongs to. So Neil is only in one set, the set of those who play hockey. Therefore, Neil plays only hockey. This is our favorite coming up next. Or is it? Describe in words the members of the set H complement intersection S. In words, we need to describe the intersection of the set S with H complement. And H complement is the set of those who do not play hockey. So, an intersection refers to the common elements of the two sets. Therefore, we are talking about those who play squash but do not play hockey. Those who belong to the set of those who play squash and at the same time, they belong to the set of those who do not play hockey. So, notation that we have here represents those who play squash but do not play hockey. Using a pencil, a ruler, and a pair of compasses only, construct triangle PQR in which QR is equal to 8.5 centimeters, PQ is equal to 6 centimeters, and PR is equal to 7.5 centimeters. We like that. We like to construct triangles. And of course, this one is not very difficult because we need to construct one whose sides are given. So, what do we do? With the aid of the ruler, draw a line QR 8.5 centimeters long. So there is our ruler. We take up up to 8.5 centimeters. And that will be RQ, which is RQ is 8.5 centimeters long, the one that was given first. Then we will construct which one? Place the point of the compass at the 0 centimeter mark on the ruler and adjust the pair of compasses in such a way that the point of the pencil is at the 7.5 centimeters mark. So there is no doubt as to which line we are drawing now. The one that is 7.5 centimeters long, PR. So we are going to open our compass to 7.5. What do we do next? Without adjusting the pair of compasses, place the point of the compass at R and make an arc as shown. Of course, just take a look and you'll see how it is done. Put the compass point at R without adjusting the compass in any way. Make an arc. And that is the arc as shown. We are going to draw now the next line which is PQ, 6 centimeters long. So place the point of the compass at the 0 centimeter mark on the ruler and adjust the pair of compasses in such a way that the point of the pencil is at the 6 centimeters mark. 
open your compass or your pair of compasses to the six centimeters mark without adjusting the pair of compasses place the point of the compass at the other end Q of the line and make an arc that intersects the first one intersects the first one go on make your arc good that point is P and the triangle may be successfully completed by drawing line segments PR and PQ there we go we have completed the construction of our triangle anything else is required well they generally do not allow us to get away with just constructing the triangle we need to do some other construct or measure something but we are not going to get away line PT we are going to construct line PT such that PT is perpendicular to QR and meets QR at T and of course we have to consider in our minds the frame of a kite and that is what we are making use of place the point of the compass at R and adjust the pair of compasses in such a way that the point of the pencil is at P and then what do we do after that? make an arc on the lower side of the line QR so we are transferring the length PR to the other side and then we need to transfer the line or the length PQ to the other side completing the frame of a kite so place the point of the compass at Q adjust the pair of compasses in such a way that the point of the pencil is at P so put it there up to P and then you know that we need to make an arc to intersect the other one that we have right there and we will not hesitate to do that without adjusting the pair of compasses make an arc that intersects the arc recently drawn so we are not going to adjust the compasses we are just going to draw that arc so what we have done we have reflected in this line here this the length of PR right there and the length of PQ we have duplicated it right there so what we have there is actually the frame of a kite and we know that in a kite the diagonals are perpendicular to each other right and that is how we are going to get the point T in such a way that PT is perpendicular to QR with one edge of the ruler passing through P and the point of the intersection of the two arcs so we have the ruler is going to be passing through this and this and then we are going to what? draw the line PT to meet RQ at T now although we have the frame of the kite we do not need to complete the kite so we need only to draw the line as required so cause the edge of the ruler to pass through P and through the intersection right there and draw the line PT so where that line meets the line RQ that is the point T now measurement measure and state the size of the angle PQR so the central letter in the name of the angle tells us where the angle is measured or where the angle is located so we have P Q R in P Q R Q is the middle letter so that is where the angle is located place the center of the protractor at Q where the angle is located the zero line on QR and take note of the position of the line QP the line QP take note we may mark it 
or we may just point it out so QP is this line so notice where it is 60 degrees so PQR is equal to 60 degrees any more measurement measure the length PT measure the distance PT of course we have PT is equal to 5.2 centimeters PT is equal to 5.2 centimeters the diagram shows a map of a golf course drawn on a grid of one centimeter squares the scale of the map is 1 to 4,000 using the map of the golf course find the distance to the nearest meter from south gate to east gate let's go the map is on one centimeter squares so gate to east gate is three sides of a square so take note of that three sides of a square right from here one two three sides of a square or we may take a look at it right there where it's a little bit clearer for us three centimeters so make use of the ratio 1 to 4,000 we have 3 times 4,000 and that is equal to 12,000 now 100 centimeters make a meter so we are going to convert that to meters by dividing by 100 and that is equal to 12 meters we need now to calculate the distance to the nearest meter from north gate to south gate hmm north gate to south gate that is a diagonal motion and what do we do the distance from north gate to south gate may be found by considering a right angle triangle there we have our right angle triangle and what do we know one two three four five in that direction and one two three in the other direction so we are going to use Pythagoras theorem to determine the distance from north gate to south gate and we know that we have what the two perpendicular sides of the right angle triangle five units and three units so we have square root of five squared plus three squared five squared is 25 and three squared is nine Simplify that we have the square root of 34 and that is equal to 5.83 centimeters and we need to multiply that by the scale factor because we need our answer correct to the nearest meter. So we multiply that by 4,000 and we get 23,320 meters. We get 23,320 but that is in centimeters so what do we do divide by 100 in order to convert to meters and what do we get we would have received 233.2 but the statement of the problem says correct to the nearest meter Calculate now the area on the ground represented by one centimeter squared on the map. So find the area represented by one centimeter squared. The length represented by one centimeter is 4,000 centimeters because we have one to 4,000. So we are going to square 4,000 to find the area represented by one centimeter squared so that is what we have and of course 100 centimeters equal 1 meter therefore 100 times 100 which is what 10,000 centimeters squared is equal to 1 meter squared so when we are squaring 
we multiply the number by itself. Therefore, 100 multiplied by 100 turns out to be 10,000. So 10,000 centimeters squared is equal to 1 meter squared. We will therefore divide the figure that we have right here by 10,000 and we get 1,600 meters squared. Now, this is a serious problem. We need to find the actual era of the golf course giving the answer in square meters. The actual era of the golf course giving the answer in square meters. So, we may identify an approximate trapezium inside of the course. Inside of this course, we have an approximate trapezium right there. So, use the formula for its area. The area of a trapezium is what? B over 2, H1 plus H2. And of course, what do they represent? H1 and H2 are the parallel sides. B is their perpendicular distance apart. So, those are the two parallel sides. And B is their distance apart. So, there we have now 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. So, H1 is 5 and H2 is 1, 2, 3. We can have them either way. We can have 3, 5 or we can have 5, 3. So, it doesn't really matter. But B is 1, 2, 3, 4. And B has to take its position where B actually is. It does matter. We have to put B as 1, 2, 3, 4 because it represents the perpendicular distance between the two parallel sides. Good. So what do we do next? We say 4 divided by 2 is 2 and 5 plus 3 is 8. So that will turn out to be 16 centimeters squared. On the right are approximately three squares. So approximately three squares, one, two, three, right. So that is represented three centimeters squared. On the left are five complete squares. Do not forget we have three approximate here. Of course, this one is not approximate. This is actually a complete square. And of course, we have five complete squares on that side. There are four considerable fractions of squares. That means they are very large fractions, almost equal to an entire square. So we have one, two, three, four of them. So we have four of them. So there we have them. And finally, small fractions of square will make up for the missing portions of the four squares. So we have them right there. We have some little portions right there, and those may make up for the portions of the four squares that are missing. So, in all, the total area is therefore 16 here, the 3 that we have right here, the 5 that we have right here, and the 4 that we have right there. So let us make sure that is correct. Yes, 16 plus 4 is 20, 3 plus 5 is 8. So 28 centimeters squared. So multiply this by the actual area that a centimeter squared represents. Remember, we did a calculation in which we determine the actual area on the ground represented by 1 centimeter squared. So we have 28 centimeters squared right there. We will multiply that by the actual area that is represented by 1 centimeter squared. And it turns out to be 44,800 meters squared. There is one flaw with the statement of the problem. Find the actual area of the golf course. 
it is virtually impossible to find the exact area of a shape that cannot be exactly divided into small shapes of calculable areas. So, because candidates get overwhelmed by the word exact, they may be tempted to find the area of the entire large region. This does not come as a surprise because it is the only obvious shape that they may be able to find the exact area of. So they may be tempted to find the entire area that we have there because of the word exact. They would not be right because the problem states that the course is drawn on the grid of 1 cm squares. Therefore, the large rectangle is not the course. The course is the map that is drawn on the grid. I am a bit skeptical about the practicality of the problem. It may be that the dissection of the area required may be necessarily too time consuming under examination conditions for the number of marks allotted to it. So it may be that in order to dissect it to the full analysis of it in order to arrive at a reasonable value of the area it may be that this problem is too time consuming for the number of marks allotted to it. Now we have a rectangular prism whose volume is given as 960 centimeters cube. The cross section ABCD is a square. The length of the prism is 15 centimeters and we are required to calculate the length of AB. So the volume of any prism is equal to the product of its length and its cross sectional area. So that is what the volume is equal to. V is equal to cross-sectional area multiplied by L. The cross-sectional area is 960 centimeters cube and the length is 15 centimeters as we have it right there. So we are going to replace the volume with 960 and we are going to replace the length with 15. So the area is the only thing that will be missing from that formula and we need to calculate the length of AB so we have the area 960 divided by 15 of course we are dividing by 15 on both sides in which 15 is eliminated from the right hand side and we have 960 to be divided by 15 and that I think is equal to 64 correct. AB is the length of the side of the square and the area of the square is 64 centimeters squared. The area of a square is equal to the square of the length of each side and of course in this case the side that we want is AB and of course the area of the square is equal to AB squared. So AB squared is equal to 64. Taking the square root of both sides, what do we know? The square is going to be eliminated from the left hand side and on the right hand side we have AB is equal to the square root of 64. So AB is equal to 8 centimeters. When the square root occurs or when the square root exists, it exists in pairs, positive and negative. But this time we are talking about the side of a square and that cannot be negative so we automatically by default take the positive square root of 64 then we will determine the total surface area of the prism now the total surface area we do what the total surface area contains two of the squares of area 64 centimeters squared, one at the one end and the other at the back end. So two of those and what do we know next? Each of the other four rectangles is of area 8 
times 15 8 by 15 so 8 8 8 8 so each one is 8 by 15 so we have 4 of them so 4 8 by 15 or 15 by 8 multiplication is commutative so the order does not affect the result so adding well performing the multiplication we have 2 times 64 is 128 and if we need to multiply 4 by 15 by 8 we say 4 times 15 is 60 and 6 8 is 48 so 480 so putting those together we have 608 centimeters squared two variables x and y are related such that y varies inversely as the square of x how do we write that write an equation in x and y and of course we will include k which is a constant of variation so y varies inversely as the square of x so x is equal to some constant k divided by the square of x so y varies inversely as the square of x y is equal to k over x squared then we need to determine the constant of variation y as a matter of fact we have x is 3 and y is 2 and of course we are going to be using this same formula in all of our calculations so x is equal to 3 and y is equal to 2 using this formula substituting we have y is equal to so 2 is equal to k over 3 squared simplifying we have 2 times 3 squared is equal to k so of course k is equal to 2 times 9 3 squared is equal to 9 no problem with that we are dividing by 3 squared on this side we multiply both sides by 3 squared 3 squared will be eliminated from this side and we have 2 multiplied by 3 squared on the other side and k is equal to 2 nines 18 next we need to find the value of r and we are going to our original expression or equation which defines the relationship between x and y so determine the value of r x is equal to 1.8 and y is equal to r so where we see x we put 1.8 where we see why we put R and do not forget K is equal to 18 so where we see K we put 18 so we have R is equal to 18 divided by 1.8 squared of course we have 18 and we are dividing by 1.8 the result turns out to be 5.56 next we are required to find the value of f so find the value of f f is x 8 is y and we are going to be reminded in a short while that the value of k is 18 right so k is 18 x is replaced by f and y is replaced by 8 so 18 over f squared is equal to 8 so by transposition we are multiplying by f squared on both sides the f squared is going to be eliminated from the right hand side and we have 8 multiplied by f squared on the left hand side so f squared is equal to 18 divided by 8 because we are eliminating this 8 so we divide both sides by 8 in which case 
8 is going to be eliminated from the left hand side and 18 will be divided by 8 on the right hand side. So 18 divided by 8 is 2.25 and of course we have f squared is equal to 2.25. So finding the square root of both sides, the square will be eliminated from the left hand side and we have the square root of 2.25 on the right hand side. So on that right hand side we have the square root of 2.25 and that is 1.5. Good. C. Determine the equation of the line which is parallel to the line y is equal to 2x plus 3 and passes through the coordinates 4, 7. Now, if two lines are parallel, they have the same gradient and the gradient can be easily identified from here. So the line y is equal to 2x plus 3 is already in the form. y is equal to mx plus c. It is in the form y is equal to mx plus c. The x coefficient that we have here is 2 and that is the gradient. And we are saying now that lines that are parallel have the same gradient. So the line that we are trying to determine the equation of is going to have the same gradient as the one that we have right there because lines that are parallel have the same gradient and of course those two lines are parallel. And of course we know that it passes through the point 4, 7 and we may use one of those formulae that we have in order to determine the equation of the line. So we are going to use y minus y1 is equal to gradient x minus x1. So y minus what is the value of y here? 7. And that is equal to what is the gradient? 2. And then we have x minus what is the value of x? 4. So there we have it. y minus 7 is equal to 2 x minus 4 and by simplification we get 2 times x 2x expanding the brackets first and 2 times negative 4 negative 8 now we are going to eliminate the 7 from the left hand side and we need to add 7 to both sides so adding 7 to both sides the 7 will be eliminated from the left hand side and we will have negative 8 plus 7 which is equal to a negative 1 on the right hand side. So y is equal to 2x minus 1. Three tones P, Q and R are such that the bearing of P from Q is 0, 70 degrees and R is 10 kilometers due east of Q and of course PQ is 5 kilometers. So, let's see what we have there. The bearing of P from Q is 70 degrees, 0, 70 degrees. There we have it. Use the other two sides and the angle that they form to find PR. So, we need to find first the distance PR. PR. And we know that we can find the length of any side of a triangle if the other two sides and the angle that the two sides form are given and we may use the cosine rule so we do not know at this particular stage or not that we do not know but it is not indicated right here this angle that we have right here is not indicated but it is the angle that is formed by the two sides 5 kilometers and 10 kilometers so north and east are 90 degrees to each other so we have north and east they are 90 degrees to each other this one is 70 so the angle that we have on the inside is the rest of 90 degrees so we have 90 minus 70 is equal to 20 degrees 20 degrees will go right there then we will apply the cosine rule to say 5 squared 
plus 10 squared. We're talking about the two sides that form the angle and the angle that the two sides form. So 5 squared plus 10 squared minus 2 times 5 times 10 cosine 20. And let's see how we simplify that by squaring 5 to 25 and squaring 10 to 100. Then we have 2 times 10 times 5. Don't forget, 2 times 5 is 10 times 10 is 100. And cosine 20 was determined by using a calculator and that is 0 0.94. So, multiplying 0 0.94 by 100 is simple. Increase by two places of decimal, we have 94. So, 125 minus 94 and that is 31. So, PR squared is equal to 31. Squaring, finding the square root of both sides, the square will be eliminated from the left hand side and we have the right hand side 31, the square root of that and we have the square root of 31, PR is equal to the square root of 31 and that is 5.57 and that is in kilometers. Given that, angle QPR is 142 degrees. State the bearing of R from P. Let's see if it can be stated. It says state. So we have QPR is 142 degrees. Goes right there. And two angles in the triangle are 142 degrees and 20 degrees. So we need to find the other. Come on. Two angles in a triangle are given already. The other one is the rest of 180. So we subtract all those from 180 and we end up with 18 degrees. There's no problem whatsoever with that one. And it goes right there. So that is 18 and we are required to state the bearing of R from P. So the bearing of R is 18 degrees beyond west. So the bearing is 18 degrees beyond west. And of course we know our original instructional material will tell us that east is 90 degrees, south is 180 degrees, west is 270 degrees. So the bearing is 18 degrees beyond west west is 270 degrees so we have an additional 18 degrees there so we have notice that we have our north line clockwise from north we have 270 and an additional 18 so 270 plus 18 is equal to 288 degrees the problem said write down well, I have here that the problem said state. We should therefore be able to look at the values and write down the answer. The problem requires more imagination than that. So although the problem says state, we should be able to just look at it and state. But the problem requires a little bit more imagination than just to look at it and state the bearing as we have just seen. Lovely. A class of 32 students participated in running a 400 meters race in preparation for their sports day. The time in seconds taken by each student is recorded and is not below. We have it right there. Good. And we have all of them. Copy and complete the frequency table to represent this data. So we will complete the frequency table. What do we do? One very efficient way of organizing a frequency table from raw data is to tally values in their respective classes. So we have a tally column in the table and we will begin. 83 is between 80 to 84 inclusive, 51, 50 to 54 inclusive, and 56, 55 to 59 inclusive, and so on. 
so we will take each one and of course while marking of the value there we insert a stroke in the relevant column inside of the table so we have 62 now will go between 60 and 64 and of course when we say between 60 and 64 we mean inclusive we have 78 will go between 70 will go in the class 70 to 74 inclusive and of course 82 between 80 and 84 inclusive 59 between 55 and 59 inclusive of course a fifth item is represented by a diagonal stroke that completes the group of five so when we are about to complete a group of five we represent that by using a diagonal stroke so where we see a diagonal stroke going across a set we know that it goes across a set of strokes and it will go across a set of four strokes so the set the entire set will be five strokes so we have one right there probably 62 to right so the diagonal stroke is used to complete groups of four 78 will go in its right slot between 75 to 79 inclusive 68 will go between 65 and 69 inclusive and finally we have 75 going in its correct spot match tele items with frequencies and confirm the ones that are already there so we have some frequencies are given already and of course we have three tally right there so we are sure that's correct we have four for that one it's correct and what do we have for the other a group of five and another one so that's six no problem what about the others three and a group of five another two a group of five and another two so we have seven and what is next four finally we have a group of five that's very good using the raw data determine the range of the data so what is the range the range is the difference between the largest and smallest items in the data set so we have 51 83 those are the extremes and of course if we look quite carefully we have another 83 there close to it but we know that 83 is the largest and 51 is the smallest so we have 83 minus 51 is equal to 32 and that is the range D now we have D before we have C and that is because C requires a graph but D does not and we may calculate it right here so let us go straight ahead the total of those who finish the race in less than 60 seconds are those who finish in 50 to 59 seconds so find the probability by dividing the result by 32 and of course 32 is the total but we are required to determine the probability that a student completes the race in less than 60 seconds so those who will finish in less than 60 seconds are those that finish between 50 and 59 seconds inclusive there we have them so the probability is 7 over 32 so these two items in the frequency column are added together to give the total of those who finish 
between 50 to 59 seconds, which will represent those who finish the race in less than 60 seconds. A frequency polygon is drawn by plotting the midpoint of each class interval against the associated frequency. We need to include the midpoints in the table. We are about to draw a frequency polygon. In order to draw the frequency polygon, we need the midpoints of the class interval. So, we include a column for the midpoints. The midpoint is found by taking the average of the class limits of each class. So, to find the average, we add both class limits and divide the result by 2. So, we have 50 plus 54 divided by 2, and that is equal to 52. Then, 55 plus 59 divided by 2, that is 57. And, of course, 60 plus 64 divided by 2, that is 62. And 65 plus 69 divided by 2 is 67. So use the pattern, namely, increasing by 5 each time to complete the table. So increasing by 5, we have 72, then 77, and 82. Because of the horizontal scale, we need to break the axis. Be in mind that the grid on the computer is not an exact match with that of a regular graph paper. However, an accurate representation of a frequency polygon is given in the accompanying booklet. So, start by drawing a small portion. We are going to break the axis. So, we have drawn that small portion. Continue by drawing an inclined line. That's our inclined line. Draw another line. Passing the axis on its way down. And for every one that we have described, we have drawn the line so that you can see. Draw the final line that returns to the level of the axis. And there we have it. And of course, we know exactly what we are going to do. Finish by drawing the horizontal axis. We are going to plot frequency against midpoint so the first one is 52 and we go up to 3 mark an x this next one is 57 and we go up to 4 up to 4 the other one 62 and we go up to Six, sixty-seven. We go up to three, seventy-two. Right, and all the way up to seven. So we start to have an interesting shape for our frequency polygon. Then seventy-seven, and we go up to four. And 82, we go up to 5. We go up to 5, and the interesting feature of our frequency polygon continues. Right. So, that is the shape of our frequency polygon before its legs touch the ground. The midpoints before the first and after the final will be at 47 and 87. The graph will meet the axis at those positions. So if we follow this sequence that we have here, at this end, the midpoint of the class that would have been previous to 52 would have been at 5 less. So 52 minus 5 is 47. So it is located at 47. And the other one would be 82 at the other end. 82 
plus 5 is equal to 87 and the graph will stand on its two feet at those locations.